One of my favorite uh, applications of particle swarm optimization is one that occurred fairly early on and it involves the optimization of the mix of ingredients in a pharmaceutical product. I can say publicly now that this was done for Eli Lilly. Uh, for a while we couldn't talk about it publicly, but Lilly has graciously agreed and we put it in the book that uh, we published when we, when we wrote up particle swarm optimization. They had been given a mandate to get rid of all of the animal-derived ingredients in a particular product that they make. Uh, the product was made over in Terre Haute, Indiana, and was manufactured by mixing together 12 ingredients, letting those ingredients ferment for a week, seven days, and then pulling the product off the bottom of the vat. So if you picture a 55-gallon drum with the, these gr ingredients all mixed, and then at the end of the week you have so much product at the bottom, they wanted to be able to get rid of the animal ingredients and still maintain the same amount of product yield. So the goal was to come up with a mixture of uh, the 12 ingredients that gave the same yield as they had before, they had a large, um, relatively large uh, number of people working on this at Lilly, and um, they used a traditional design of experiments approach. And this means that they started out within what they thought was feasible space for this mixture of ingredients, and they did experiments over the space of um, a number of weeks that let them come up with a new set of ingredients and they were successful with their traditional design of experiments approach and that their result at the end was 1.05 yield, in other words 5 percent more than they were getting before. Um, one of my former students named Brian Hartman who worked at Eli Lilly at the time uh, came to me and said look I wonder if particle swarm optimization would work here. Well we don't have any money but I have a chemist who's willing to come in on weekends, uh, work on Saturday, and we can have one set of flasks and let's see what we can do with it. So we started out with 15 flasks, no money, and a once a week adjustment using particle swarm. And at the end of the same time that the design of experiments people finished, um, we had a yield of 2.2. This was amazing. In other words, we were getting 220 percent of the amount of yield they were getting before more than doubling it. It didn't seem to be feasible to the people at Lilly. In other words, our solution looked like to them it was not in what they defined as feasible space. There was nothing infeasible about it because we were simply mixing ingredients that they told us they w that was available. But this particular combination of them, according to their scientists, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't work. Well, it did work and after people at Eli Lilly replicated it a couple of times to make sure that it was indeed a solution that would increase the yield. Um, I can say particle swarm became much more accepted at Lilly than it had beforehand. And it's kind of one of my favorite stories because one of the things I tell people is let the swarm fly. We have found a number of solutions that were not supposedly in feasible space. Now, now sometimes space isn't feasible, but you know there are other times such as this where we'll find solutions that nobody else has found. They didn't think it was really in feasible space and we let the swarm fly and find the solutions.